just about to begin. Hey, good morning, Gold Creek. I hope you're having a great Sunday today. Hey, we have a special guest in town. I would call him a guest, uh, but he's really more, he's more like family, kind of like a crazy uncle. Uh, my good friend James Powell is here, and Pastor James is kicking off our brand new message series for the summer. It's called Non-Negotiables, and in the series, we're going to be looking at really foundational elements of the Christian faith. So I hope you'll join us for it, uh, whether it's here in the room or staying in touch with us online. I'm really looking forward to a summer series together. I'll be back next Sunday. This Sunday, I had a good friend ask me to come down and speak for him at a church in Texas. So I'm showing him that we have everything figured out in Seattle faith-wise and uh, I'm looking forward to being with you next week. Pastor James is going to come up in just a moment. And when he does, would you help me welcome him today? Well, good morning, Gold Creek. I guess it's crazy Uncle James. I'm glad to be here with you guys this weekend. And uh, I just love the ending of that video. I always feel like I'm in a Star Wars movie when that thing goes off, just hear the lasers shooting off, it's crazy. Um, so thankful to be here. I, I gotta tell you, our dearest friends in the world, the Wallsteads, we love them. And we're so thankful that, that of all the places in the world that God could have planted them, that he gave them to you, Gold Creek Church, as your pastors. Uh, they love you, and they pray for you often, and I love how much they are thriving in this community. It's incredible to see what God's doing. Uh, this weekend, I got the honor and privilege to travel with my nine-year-old son, Braxton. My wife and I, we've been married almost uh, 13 years. We have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, and my nine-year-old, you know, they say, like, stay around kids. I hear people say this, stay around kids because they keep you young. I've never felt older in my life than this weekend. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just, all the things that like are bizarre and new to me, technology-wise, like my kid jumps in the plane, he's plugging stuff in and tapping the screen. I'm like, I've, I've ridden in planes for months lately and didn't know that did that, you know? Uh, just this morning, uh, we were riding, we, we Ubered over to the church and uh, we get in the car and it's a Tesla. And I'm like, oh, this is fun, you know? And then the guy's like, yeah, it's completely autopilot. It's like, what? It's crazy. And my nine year old's like, yeah, dad, like Elon Musk, Tesla, autopilot, it's just what they do. I'm like, okay. Like, I still come from the day and age where, like, a good Friday night was your parents are gonna take you to the Blockbuster. <laughs> And it's a really good Friday night if you go to the movie of your selection and there's actually a VHS behind the cover. Yeah, you're like, it was a V, like people are Googling VHS. A DVD, okay, it was like having your phone behind a cover and you could watch stuff. I don't know how to explain it, but that was a good Friday night. You're like growing up, there were all these things that were like just new. And, and I, I find myself, I'm 37, I find myself feeling 57 with my nine-year-old as we have conversations when I say things like, when I was growing up. <laughs> and I was telling him the other day, I'm like, you don't understand, bro. Like, you have a phone that has the internet in it. When I was growing up, we needed a CD to put in our computer that had a cable running to the, the wall. And, and it would like, and you would get, you would get AOL. Did anybody here admit you had an AOL account? Are you, old? no one's old enough? A few are old enough? The, the cool thing about the AOL account, every once in a while was this. I just, I always got really excited when it'd say, you've got, yes. I was like, yes, I do. Someone, email. this is before a lot of spam mail. That meant someone thought about you enough to electronically send you mail. Oh, it was great. Now, you're like, James, mail's been around forever. It has but I feel like the normal mail, you just never know what you're gonna get. Like you go to the mailbox now, it's like you may get a bill, eh, don't like those. I make two piles in my house. I have my wife's pile of mail and my pile. Her pile, 
is all of the bills. So I'm like, these are yours. I don't even wanna know what they are. What I say for myself, I call them the affirmation mail like pile. It's things like you've been pre-approved. Like, yes, I have. Come on. Discover doesn't even know me, but I have been pre-approved by them. Ah, I needed that approval today. The thing about mail is it's a mixed bag. And whether you're getting bills or credit card pre-approvals, we all know this. There's nothing better than whether it's a text message or email, an actual snail mail, whatever it is, when someone sends something personally to you that they thought long and hard about what they were gonna write, or something that's meaningful, it has thought behind it. It's not just a picture and a post. It's I took the time to write this down because I think it has true meaning. This weekend, as we kick off this brand new series called Non-Negotiables, in this first week, we're gonna look at the book of Romans in the second half of scripture, but to give us a little bit of perspective, it's not just a book. There's this man named Paul, and he had had this radical encounter with Jesus Christ, appeared to him on the road to this place called Damascus, and because of this, his life had been transformed. And he begins to write a letter to the early church at Rome. And what he's writing to them is, is more like a will and testament. It's, hey, for you to really succeed in this spiritual journey, to really be the, the Jesus person you've always longed to be, here's some things that I think will be helpful for your future. So in Romans chapter one, he kicks this thing off. And because we're in Romans one and it's week one, and if we're honest, whether you've been around church a long time or you're new to being a Jesus person, we find ourselves asking this question about faith often, especially when introducing someone new to faith, is where do I start? If you can think back, maybe it's been last week or maybe it's years ago, even when you begin to read the Bible for the first time, you're like, where do I start? You know, Leviticus? No. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> maybe start like Gospel of John. But we all ask, where do I start? I know it's gonna be a, a difficult journey, but what's a good foundational place to start. And Romans 1, I think, gives us a good perspective. It says this in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle or overseer of churches, and set apart for the gospel of God, that being the good news about Jesus, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets, that's in the first half of Scripture known as the Old Testament, in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son who is to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God. Would you circle the words son of God in your outline? In power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse five, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles. Would you circle the word all the Gentiles? Circle those few words. To the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake, and you also are among these Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. See, James, we're asking the question, where do I start? And I don't know that this gives me more clarity. Let me give you the context of Paul's love letter to the early church at Rome. He's making two bold proclamations right here. Number one, he's making a proclamation that Jesus was divinely God's son. Now, the reason this is so important is because in that day and age, you have a lot of people running around with different belief systems, claiming to have secret knowledge or secret pathways to God, and Paul is letting them know there are no more secret pathways. You don't need secrets. God sent a son, and that son, Jesus, lived the perfect life we could never live. He died a death that we deserve because of our own sin or shortcomings, but he wasn't just buried. He was raised to new life to demonstrate the power of God. Paul's making a bold proclamation to remind the early church Jesus was divinely God's son. And the reason that's powerful is the second proclamation is tied to it, and it's simply this. What is the proclamation that, that Paul's saying? He's saying the gospel is for all people everywhere. Now, that is a bold proclamation, and maybe you've been a Jesus person long enough, you just go like, yeah, of course, two plus two equals four. But to remember that the Roman Empire is oppressing and occupying, they are, they are going into territories and conquering, and they're saying, we're more powerful. There were these schisms amongst people of who was smarter, who had more intellect, who had more uh, financial means, who had more favor with God by their bloodline or by behavior. And Paul comes along and says this. Recognizing that Jesus was divinely God's son, 
You have to also recognize that God so loved the entire world, all people, that he has sent his son to save us, who are all people. We are all people. Would you look at your neighbor, just remind them real quick, and you're like, all the introverts are like, this is why I watch online. I hate when you tell me to talk to my neighbor. I rode to church with my neighbor, and I didn't talk to him. I don't wanna talk to him now. It's your opportunity. I hope you brush your teeth. Okay, look at your neighbor, say you are in all people. Now this is important, why? Because if we're not careful, we will lean into the unique creation, how God created us uniquely and wonderfully made, but forget that God created you that way as well. When I share in the understanding that Paul's proclamation of the early church is still a principle of, the, of today's church in our time, which is this, Jesus is divinely God's son, but he's divinely God's son for all people everywhere. God's power, grace, and love is not limited to a location or a building. He came for everyone. Well, how do we see that demonstrated? And what do you do if you go, James, I'm an all people, but you gotta understand, I just don't feel like I measure up to these all people that Paul's probably writing about or to. Well, we need to look at the life of Jesus. Jesus had this indictment put on him at one point in his earthly life, they said this, they said Jesus was a friend of sinners and they did this to assassinate his character, but they did not assassinate his character. Instead, they accelerated his kingdom, which was to remind us that God drew near to those that people often steer far from. The second half of the scripture in the Gospel of Mark, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, known as the Gospels, the story of not only Jesus' life and miracles, his death, burial, and resurrection, but it's the story of how you and I are invited into the family of faith to become Jesus' people. In the Gospel of Mark, something interesting takes place. Jesus is being announced as the Messiah, the one who would save, uh, the liberator, the king, the king of kings, which is a bold proclamation. In the midst of all of that, Jesus keeps associating with people that other people wouldn't. And so I want us to do this. I want us to look at three ways that we understand that this is good news for not just some people, not just good news for select people, not just good news for perfect people, which by the way, those don't exist at all. Amen. I hope you didn't elbow your neighbor when you amen me. Would you do this? Would you take your pulse real quick? Just take your pulse. And if you have one, would you nod at me real quick? Okay, I need an usher second row, <laughs> left section. I'm not getting a pulse. Okay, we got one. Okay, all right, you have a pulse. And some preachers, they say these things. They'll say, oh, if you got a pulse, you got a purpose. I mean, that feels good. I'm like, yes, I do. I'm a different kind of preacher. <laughs> if you got a pulse, you have problems. That's what you have, right? Why? Because you're human. And human beings have a human condition called sin. But Jesus didn't steer away from sin. So I want you to look at this. The very first point this weekend is this. Jesus sees people, not just their problems. Jesus sees people, not just their problems. Now, we expect that of Jesus, but we need to be honest about it ourselves. We don't always see people, not just their problems. In fact, we have this innate ability to be able to see someone's problem and then use their name as an adjective. Oh, come on. Everybody has somebody in your family that you tell your kids you like, you better not Jason that. <laughs> we all know what Jason did. We all know what Jason acts like. Jesus did not do that. He saw people, purpose, and God's creation beneath the surface of the dirt of their problems. Let me show it to you in the Gospel of Mark, chapter two, and let's, let's start in verse 14. It says this, as he, being Jesus, walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Would you circle that in your outline, the tax collector's booth? And Jesus told him, come and follow me, and Levi got up and followed him. Upon first glance at this, we go, this is a normal interaction. Jesus walked by someone and said, hey, I'm Jesus, let's go. And they said, cool. That's not what happened. First of all, we get an understanding of who Levi is. He's not just son of Alphaeus. He's a tax collector. And because you didn't go, oh, I know that you don't understand the context of what a tax collector was then and there. This is not an IRS agent, no. Because the Roman Empire was occupying Jewish territory and oppressing the Jewish people, 
they would get taxes from the Jewish people in order to expand the empire. But it was even greater than that. What they would do is they would go in and not use a Roman official to gain taxes from the Jewish people. They would employ a Jewish person to get the taxes from Jewish people and they would allow the Jewish person taxing their own people, oppressing their own people to pad their own pockets, uh, pockets and tax them even more. So Levi, Levi's a bad dude. He is notorious. Everyone who walked by him knew the ability for me to provide for my family and put food on the table is inhibited by you being greedy, by you stealing from me and you oppressing me for my oppressor. And yet Jesus comes by and says, follow me. Jesus had a better language than you and I do. You and I, if we're not careful, we lean into a language of shame. Our vocabulary is shaped by guilt and shame. Several years ago, we were pastoring in Sacramento, California, and we were gonna leave right after our Easter services, and I wanted to take my two sons, we have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, Braxton and Grayson, and I wanna take them somewhere we go swimming, and somewhere real family-friendly, and so of course I took them to the one place that's really family idea, you know, Las Vegas, and uh, don't judge me. Um, truthfully, my six-year-old, he loves the Avengers, he loves Marvel. And there's a, a Marvel Avengers exhibit in Las Vegas at the hotel that we stayed at. And so we decided, hey, we're gonna take them there, we can swim, and then we'll go see all the Avengers. And he was so excited, he could not wait. Six year old, he was on pins and needles, you know. He wanted to see them the night we got there. We're like, well, they're, they're asleep right now, buddy. They're sleeping, and that's what we need to do. You wanna be a little superhero, go to sleep, all right? And so we went to sleep, woke up the next morning, wants to skip breakfast, let's go see the Avengers. Finally, we get to the Avengers exhibit. He's in line, and Six-year-olds are gonna do what six-year-olds do, you know? They're not patient, they're antsy, and I'm ready, can we go, are we there yet? You know, they're doing their thing. My wife and I, you know, we should've got a medal that day, we're being so patient. I'm like, I'm looking at her, she's looking at me, we're like, we're doing this, like, we are doing so good, it's fine, we're almost there, and we're in line, and we're coaching our six-year-old, our nine-year-old's helping, as he always does, older siblings. Um, then all of a sudden, right behind me, there was a woman who was not with us who decided that somehow this was her opportunity to co-parent with my wife and I, our child. Oh, yeah. Oh, I wanted to talk to her. I was ready, I was, I was ready but I noticed out of the corner of my eye, my wife taking the hoops out of her ears. I was like, whoa, uh, babe, you, you, you stop. Uh, uh, Ma'am, we're good, you know. But here's what she has said to my six-year-old. She looked at my six-year-old and she said this, little boy, you better watch out. If you don't straighten up, they're gonna come get you. I wanted to look at her and say, who is they? Bring it, because <laughs> they gotta go through me first. You know, I was ready. I was a fighter spirit on the inside of me. I wanted to let her know that I was holy, but I was also hood, but I did not. Instead, I just looked back at my child and we began to talk. See, what I recognized was most of us grew up with a language of shame. Even as a child, if you broke something in your house, even on accident, maybe even as you grew up, you did something, you messed up at school, you'd have a teacher or a parent who would say something like this, shame on, oh, I know you know it, shame on, oh yeah, some of us have even said it, we're like, oh, I don't like saying it. Say shame on you. The reason that's powerful is some of us have grown up as adults and today we mess up and we break things like relationships or financial decisions or jobs, friendships. And internally we go, shame, shame on me. But that is not what Jesus does. Oh, I love that when Jesus walks by this bad dude named Levi, that instead of going, shame on you, Levi, you thief, you oppressor, Jesus says, follow me. Now you say, James, he's just, giving geographical directions. No, he's not. If you break down the origin of, of the language of that word, he's actually saying, come and be a part of this way. Live the life I'm living. It's as if Jesus says, I am the embodiment of grace. And you may be filthy in your sin, 
But instead of shame on you, I will be the one to come and say, shame off you, grace on you, mercy on you, purpose towards your life. That's good news for you today. I don't care how bad you messed up yesterday or last week or the sin you did 10 years ago that no one knows about that keeps you up at night. Listen to me. Jesus does not call out your sin. He calls off your shame and brings grace to your life. Jesus sees people, not just their problems. Oh, that's good news for us. That's good news for our souls that we can recognize you will never measure up. Your performance, your ethics, your morals are not good enough, but God's grace is. And Jesus saw people beneath the burden of their problems. What does he do with Levi? Well, number two, you, you gotta recognize this, that Jesus invites everyone to the same place. Everyone in the same place. He says, follow me, but you're about to have a moment of irony when you see where Jesus followed Levi to in verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house. Wait a minute. Jesus tells this man to follow him to his own house. There's gotta be more to the story. Yes, Jesus is inviting him to the way to, to live like me. But I love that what Jesus does is he doesn't just go to Levi's house alone. As a matter of fact, it says this. It says he has dinner and there were many tax collectors and sinners. Many. I love that Jesus doesn't single them out. He also doesn't throw two different dinner parties. He doesn't throw one for the disciples and one for the sinners. It goes on and says that there were tax collectors, sinners, and disciples. What you have to know is there were disciples there that were Jewish people who'd been oppressed by the tax collectors. And Jesus sets a table of mercy and grace and calls them all to it. Oh, that's the beauty of a place like Gold Creek, that we don't separate people based on their past or their present struggles. Instead, we say, come, come all who are weary. Why? Because he will give you rest. He's having dinner with them. There were many who had followed him. Many. It said when the teachers of the law who were the Pharisees, these were people who had kept up 600 plus laws every single day. They saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners. They asked this question, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? If we're not careful, as Jesus people, we follow Jesus long enough that we think we earned this thing. That somehow we, we deserve some standing in the church or some standing in our relationships. Friends, the Pharisees, the disciples, the tax collectors and sinners were all human beings. I don't care how good they were or how bad they were. Without Jesus Christ, they were all dead in sin. But because of Jesus, all of these people had access to God's grace. Let us remind ourselves that no one is dirtier than I am, that we all are on the same trajectory without the grace of God. I cannot be one of the people who chooses to put an exclamation point on your sin just because you sin differently than I do. Let us not be a people who point out the sin of others just because they sin differently than we do. Sin requires the same blood of Jesus for all of us. But if Jesus does that and he invites all people to the same place, why do we as Jesus people struggle? Why do we struggle with that? I think sometimes we struggle because we don't understand what we're actually equipped with. We think if we get around sinners, they're gonna make us dirty. They, we think if we get around a couple of people who feel like they're far from God that we're gonna somehow lose this preciousness that we have. Can I remind you, well, First, let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever used a bar of soap on dirty hands? Show of hands, bar of soap on dirty hands. I'm judging the ones of you who haven't. Okay, right, well, do not shake my hand in the lobby if you have not washed your hands. Okay, you wash your hands with a bar of soap. I, I can remember washing my dirty, I mean, hands were filthy, wash them with a bar of soap, right? And then you put the bar of soap up, you rinse your hands off. Now, how many of you in the room that have ever done that? Then you got your, your Dawn soap, and you washed your dove soap because you had put your dirty hands on the dove soap? You're like, y'all do weird stuff in Florida. No, we don't even do that in Florida. Like, nobody does that. It's weird. Why? Because you don't expect dirt to hurt soap. Second half of Scripture simply says this. Greater is he that's in you 
than the enemy that's in the world. We as believers, as Jesus people, have to stop being afraid to get around people who feel like they're far from God or act like that or are sinning or tax collectors and going, oh, they're gonna, something of them's gonna get on me. No, I wish you would recognize that the Holy Spirit in you is full of grace, mercy, and compassion, full of patience, full of kindness, long-suffering, and gentleness, that instead of you worrying about what gets on you from them, what have you got around them? and the God in you begin to wrestle with what's in them? What if you got the living soap, the, the cleaner of all sins living in you, and people are just waiting for you to get around them? I wonder what it would look like the next time you get in a situation, instead of running from people, you choose to do the hard work, which is the heart work. Dig a little bit deeper and invite them all to the same place. Jesus Jesus refused to have separate seating or VIP placement based on performance because everyone fell short. If you and I aren't careful, we begin to put out this, this idea in our minds. You know, I hear people compare who's the goat in basketball. You know, is it Michael Jordan? Is it LeBron? Is it Kobe? And sometimes we compare ourselves as human beings thinking like, oh, you know, I can't dunk on a 10-foot rim, but I could dunk on like eight foot. And that's kind of what it's like in, in spirituality. Like, I couldn't get to the 10-foot, but God put me on his shoulders and I can dunk on a 12-foot a rim now. Amen. No, it's as if the basketball hoops on Mars and you're jumping from Earth. You would never have gotten there and nor would anyone else. But Jesus came and did what none of us could do. He measured up in every single way. What does that require as a response? Jesus did something amazing. Point number three, and I think this is our landing point for this weekend, is Jesus gives grace to everyone, to everyone. The Pharisees have an issue. They don't mind that they're at the table. They don't mind that the disciples are at the table. They mind that sinners are there. They've forgotten that we're all sinners saved by grace. But Jesus has a poetic proclamation to give back to them. On verse 17, he says, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Would you say that with me? The sick. I'm gonna come back to that. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You ever yelled at your kids for being sick? Doubt it. And you're human. You have a pulse, you have problems, you still have sin in your life, and yet you can be compassionate enough to recognize when somebody's sick, they don't need shame, they need help. Think about it in the context of church. If we're not careful, a church can become like a hotel. I get the opportunity to travel quite a bit right now and stay in different hotels you kind of get tired of the room stuff. You're just gonna go there and sleep. You start looking for the extras, the, uh, what's the word? The, um, yeah, the amenities, the extras. Friend, if you've been around church for a while, can I caution you? Would you, would you give me the crazy uncle relational equity for a second? Say something that's gonna be hard to hear. This church and all church was not created to be a hotel for saints where we get to decide what amenities we like. I really like the worship. I really like how they sing, but I don't like the lights. I really like the kids programming, but I don't like the parking. And someone took my parking space this week. I don't like it anymore. Did you see, they changed the coffee again? Where are the donuts? Who decided we're going to Glaze Donuts? I love the donut holes. Who made that decision? I'm, I'm gonna email somebody. Not meant to be a hotel for saints. Several years ago, my wife and I were pastoring youth pastors in the Seattle area. We had taken a group of kids to this camp and my wife, she's an adventurer and she does all the fun stuff. She jumps on a dirt bike with some of the students. She's going around this dirt bike track. And I tell her right before, I say, hey babe, we're going to Hawaii next week. Don't get hurt. <laughs> she's like, all right. You know, this is for our anniversary. So excited, we saved up and scrapped every penny together for this trip, so don't mess it up. And she's like, babe, come on, I know what I'm doing. So she does the dirt bike trip. And then all of a sudden, one of the young ladies 
slips and wrecks her bike and the foot peg goes and hits my wife's leg. She was wearing sweatpants and I'm walking by and I see her going over and sitting down. She goes, babe, I think I hurt my leg. I was like, stop playing. Non-refundable deposits, Hawaii's coming up. Going, are use our points, you know? She's like, no, seriously, can you come look at it? And she pulls up her sweatpants and when she does, foot peg had gashed into her leg. We found out later it only missed the artery by about a centimeter. Being the compassionate, loving, strong husband I am, I looked at her leg and I gave the only response that I could come up with. It's bad, so bad. Oh, you think I'm kidding. Stuff on the inside was on the outside. I didn't know what to do. My wife, she just shed a tear. Babe, come on, we're gonna put some gauze in it, wrap it up, we're gonna go. Okay, so we get a car, pick up the camp nurse. Camp nurse gets in the vehicle, looks, ooh, you know, we're gonna be fine. You know what I didn't go looking for? I didn't go look for a hotel. Didn't pull up Yelp reviews on the nearest hotel. Didn't find out there was a massage or spa, jacuzzi, sauna. Why? I didn't care about that. My wife was hurting, and in my mind, in the panic of that moment, she could be dying. I, I need what? A hospital. I need an ER. I needed somewhere that we could run into, and we found the nearest hospital. I ran in there. If I met you on that day, I apologize. It was not my best moment. I went in, I was so frustrated, I was screaming, we need help, somebody help my wife now. I mean, you would have thought she had a gunshot wound. I was going berserk. Why? Someone I loved was hurting. I just needed help. That's what church is meant to be. That's how Jesus people are meant to respond. Oh, every week people are gonna come in here and they may not always smile and walk through our doors, you know, good morning, and they go, oh, good morning and God bless you. Too blessed to be stressed, blessed and highly favored, hallelujah. Guess what I didn't do that day? I didn't go in there going, hey, this is a great day. Good to see you guys. Wife, she's hurt a little, but we're good. No, I was in pain. There are people every week that run into Gold Creek Church. If you're not careful, you've been here long enough, you're like, what's their problem? Their problem is their marriage is on their last leg. The problem is their kids haven't called back home. The problem is they slipped up to the addiction they thought they beat and they're wrestling on the inside. We should be people who say shame off you, grace to everyone. We're glad you're here. We're not the doctor, but we'll help you get to the doctor. You're not the great physician, but I know the one who is. His name is Jesus. He's healer, he's master, he's savior. He's got everything you need. That's our opportunity. As Jesus people, to be people who look, live, and lead like Jesus. This weekend, I wanna give you that opportunity. Where do we start? We start with grace. We start with grace. If you're wondering what are all the things to do and not to do, stick around. This series of non-negotiables is gonna be incredible. Why? Because you're gonna begin to live a more full and free life. Rules do not restrict us. They reward us to the life we've always longed for. Next week, I'm telling you the message that Pastor Nick has, I've got a glimpse of it. And I can't wait for you to hear that message. But today, today we start with grace. Today we start with grace for your past, grace for your present, and a grace that's always been provided for your future through Jesus Christ. I'm gonna ask you left to right, front to back, on site and online to close your eyes just for a moment moment of privacy. Today, I wanna to give two groups of people the opportunity to respond. First group, you're here today and you say, James, for the first time or the first time in a long time, I wanna to choose to follow Jesus like Levi did. If he can love somebody like Levi, see the person, not their problems, I believe he can do that for me. And today, I wanna to choose to follow Jesus. On the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to slip your hand up. I'm not gonna stand you up, call you out. I just wanna pray a prayer for you. That's you. Slip your hand, one, two, three, right where you're at. Yes, ma'am, I see you. Yes, I see you. Just for a moment, keep it up. Yeah, I see you. Before I pray, there's a second group of people. You're a Jesus person, but today, if you're honest, you need to receive grace for yourself and you need to extend grace to someone else. You know there's an area that you've been holding yourself to a standard you cannot keep, and there's an area you've been holding others 
to a standard they cannot keep. And today, you're gonna put Jesus in his rightful place, in the place of grace. If that's you, I'm gonna ask you to respond in the same manner. On the count of three, just to slip your hand up. And I'm gonna pray for you. One, two, three. Yes, ma'am, I see you. Yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, all over this room. Yeah, I see you. Thank you for making a bold decision this weekend. It's not information that changes our lives. It is the application of that information that brings transformation. And God, I believe that today, in this moment, out of our response to your good news, your good grace, you're transforming lives. I pray for my friends who are choosing to trust you for the first time or first time in a long time. I pray they would throw their whole heart into trusting the work of Jesus, that he died the death we deserve but was raised to new life. Prove nothing could stop your love for us. I pray they would receive that love and that grace today. For my friends who are part of this family already claiming to be Jesus' people today, we recognize there's grace that we need to receive for our past, for our present, and there are people we need to extend grace to in our future. God, would you help us to be more than just labeled as your people, but to live like your people? We pray all of these things in the name above every name the name of our hope and liberating King. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thanks, Pastor James. It's always so good to have him here with us. Hey, if that was you that, whether it was the first time making that, that step forward, raising your hand, or maybe you were the one just saying, hey, I need the grace, I need to extend grace, receive grace. Wherever it is, you're not supposed to do this alone. We often here talk about connect groups, the importance of being connected with others, not just being here on a Sunday. The other step is, is if making a step in a faithful decision like that is, is to allow people to walk alongside of you. And so if, if you don't have people to walk alongside of you, we would love to do that as a church. We've got some great resources. You can follow the prompts on the screen to, to text in or to scan that to say, I said yes. And just see where God takes you. See where your relationship goes to that next level. In a moment, we're gonna do our tithes and our offerings, and here in about 15 minutes or so, there's a group of middle schoolers who are gonna be taking a big step. They're heading off to camp, and they're gonna have an amazing time. They're gonna have new friendships made, existing friendships made even more solid, be out in the lake, be swimming, all sorts of activities. But what we do know is, is that they're gonna be a handful of kids who have never heard about Jesus. They've never heard about this, this man called Jesus and about the great physician that he is, the healer, how we can change our lives. There's others who will have heard it, but it, all of a sudden it will come across totally different to them when they're there. The message will be different. And it's these moments that allow, we know, if you look back on it, many of us in this room, we either had kids who have made spiritual decisions or ourselves have made a spiritual decision at a camp setting like that, this will be a pivotal part of their life, their history. And it's because of your generosity as a church that we can have a staff, full-time staff, that allows, that plans and allows us to put on a big camp like this. Puts on the details where we have many of you who are camp counselors. God bless you for going there. We'll be praying for you. But let's just, as you give, just know that we're making a difference, not only in the young youth of our church, but across the community. Because there's so many who have signed up that have never come to Gold Creek before and are gonna go and experience it for the first time. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for its generosity. I thank you, Lord, that we can be a church that reaches outside the walls of our building into the community. That this next generation, Lord, can go and have an opportunity to have fun, create new friendships, make existing friendships even more strong, and, and ultimately, Lord, all on a foundation of a faith in you. And for that young man, that young woman, Lord, who is hearing the message, whether it's the first time or a time where it, is just, it, it just resonates with them, Lord, we just ask that you would just, your presence would be upon them, and that you would just allow this to be a moment where they look back in their life, and they know that's when I, I said yes. And then we pray, amen. Hey, in a moment we'll do our, or you can pass the buckets now. We have our buckets you can pass for cash or check. You also can give online. You can follow the prompts. I'll say this. As we do, we're gonna do a one last song for a worship song. 
and we're gonna be able to have a chance to do uh, prayers of the cross. And maybe you wanna pray for, you, you made a spiritual decision, but maybe it's that you wanna pray for your camper. Your middle school camper is going to camp. Maybe your spouse is gonna be a counselor, or maybe you just wanna go over there and just pray for all of that. We just wanna know the prayer team members are both here in person at the Underneath the Light of Crosses as well as online. So would you stand with me as we worship this one last song? Sunday. You're dismissed. We'll see you guys next week.